Um, so here's just a couple of reminders for you. Um, I'm not going to, I'm just going to kind of highlight some of the most important ones like we usually do. The big one that, you know, we want to make sure is if we need to slow down and discuss, let us know. We're willing to adjust the schedule. We're willing to do anything to make sure that we all understand what we're discussing. So um, don't be afraid to interrupt, to make a comment, to um, ask a question, uh, because you're not going to hurt my feelings and you're probably not going to hurt other people's feelings because we're all here to learn. Uh, but you can all read the rest of this. But again, I just want to highlight that one. So tonight we're going to talk about chapter five workflow. Uh, I'm going to kind of cover the first kind of two thirds of it. And then um, Kevin will kind of cover the last one, reproducible examples to kind of look forward. Um, chapter six, the layout themes, HTML. Um, Ryan M, you said you would take that on. And um, I think you'd be really good for that chapter. And then uh, Ryan S. So we'll have two Ryans in a row, Ryan and then Ryan you'll take chapter seven graphics. So I really appreciate you, both of you taking those on and Kevin for kind of jumping in the last second to kind of help out. So, so let's kind of talk about uh, workflow. Uh, so let's kind of talk about why we should care about our workflow. And there was this really good quote. I'm going to bump this up so people can see it a little bit better. Um, Hadley had this really good quote in the book. And I think it kind of emphasizes the reason why we should really focus in and hone on our workflow. And he says, I think of workflow as one of my secret powers. One of the reasons that I've been able to accomplish so much is that I devote time to analyzing and improving my workflow. I highly encourage you to do the same. And so when you think about it, when you're developing apps or you're developing code, the faster you can make that process, the more you can iterate, the more you can iterate, the more you can improve the product you're creating. And so if you can kind of focus on ways to make that workflow faster, you're going to become better faster. And so as part of that process as well, it's going to improve your skills to um, write better code, to make code work, and then hopefully create a better end product by the end of it. So some of the learning objectives that we're going to talk about in this chapter or what were discussed, it's really kind of to help you improve your workflow. So really kind of learning the development cycle. So some of the basics of that being how to create apps, making changes to the apps, and then quickly experimenting with the results. Then the book kind of goes into discussing uh, aspects about debugging, which I thought was really a really interesting part of the book. Um, I actually learned a lot from that section. And then the last part, which would be learn how to write self-contained uh, self reproducible examples and being able to do that so you can get help outside in the community. And so um, I'll kind of take these first two ones and then I'll just jump over to Kevin to kind of take over the looking for help and writing good reproducible examples. So let's talk about our workflow here. Uh, why a development workflow? It allows us to reduce that time between making a change and seeing the outcome. And so the book talks about different strategies that you can use to make that iteration process faster and so that you can see those changes as you're making them. The other thing it talks about is it's, it's faster, it's, it's faster so you can iterate and experiment. And then the faster you become, the better shiny developer you're going to become. And there's two main workflows that you can optimize that the book talks about. The first one is creating apps. And then the second one is making changes and experimenting with the results faster and speeding up that iterative cycle. So the first workflow that the book talks about improving is actually creating the apps. And it's really, so the first thing that the book talks about is that every app that you create is going to have the same six lines of code. It's going to have the library, the UI, the server, and then the Shiny app to actually start the Shiny app. So pretty much you're going to be writing this anytime you create a one file Shiny app. Now, a more advanced topic is about splitting the app and, or the UI and the server into separate files. We haven't got to that conversation yet, but if you are just creating one file apps, these are the same six lines you're going to start with every time. So it's just good to get used to them. However, what's nice about this is that there is a code snippet in R that allows you to um, quickly create this. And so I'm just going to bring in my R session here real quick. Uh, again, this may be a little bit different for everybody because the console is usually down here. My console is up here. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to create a new file, a new R script, 
And what you can do is you can type in shiny app. And if you hit shift tab on your keyboard, it's automatically going to populate the code for you. So that's really, really quick. So if you're somebody that needs to create this kind of framework really, really quick, just learn that shiny app shift enter. Other ways that you can do this, and I'm not going to save this. Other ways you can do this is you can start a new project. Um, this is going to be a little bit slower, but if you're somebody who likes to do the point and click, just go to new directory and then click on shiny web application and then follow the prompts to finish it. So Ryan, I see you got a question there. What can I answer for you? Well, yeah, I, I, I just wanted to interrupt or, or add to your statement of the, the quick, simple. The <clears throat> second workflow, although being a little bit more uh, uh, click intuitive, I, I don't know if that's the, a good way of saying it, but what I found is that it kind of adds more bloat. Uh, it, bloat's not a bad thing. It's just, it tries to template things and make it easier for a, a, a layman or a person that isn't as familiar with the application. The shorter version or the quicker, uh, uh, more simplified version using that uh, control uh, command, it, it, it only populates what's needed, right? The, the, the core uh, value that is required to get the Shiny app running. And I'm, I'm, I'm throwing that statement back to, I think it was two, maybe three sessions ago when we were discussing uh, your question you asked, will this run? Will this Shiny app run? And there's nothing to it. It's just a blank page, but it was a valid Shiny app. And so that's a, an important task. The second comment I was going to add to this, if you don't mind, would be in that, that second method of click worthy uh, uh, process, there's a, a, an option where it allows you to have your uh, UI and server in the same file versus an option of separating them. And I only found going through that exactly. Uh, no, that's not the way. Oh, I, I, back maybe up. it's my environment. Yeah. Well, it's that screen, but uh, maybe you have to name it first. There's, a, there's an option where it tells you, do you want a single uh, file package or do you want a dual file package? And Kevin, do you remember uh, last week or the week before we were talking about the cost benefit of using a two file system uh, to control our, our shiny application versus one file? Yeah. I think that's where a lot of this came from. Sorry. No, I was gonna say, I, I know what you're talking about. I saw that when I was yeah. like, person up and but like, <laughs> like where you well, I didn't them to choose. The, no, I didn't find it in the, I didn't oh. find it in the book anywhere where it may have uh, delineated between what's better or not. Uh, I actually created some notes for myself. Uh, there's a, uh, uh, she is a PhD uh, uh, a developer. Uh, I want to say it's over in Europe. Anyway, uh, very credible individual, but they put at the very uh, bottom of their forum post, the reason that you have two files separated is to allow for a, a more eloquent control of both UI and the server side languaging. So it's, it's, they do the same thing, uh, but it was the only reference I could find to uh, where I, I mentioned the, the two file app version versus a single file version. Oh, Ryan, I have a question. Um, I think the two files would be yes. very handy because sometimes you use the same UI for many different server functions or it you know, would for be, example, right. if you have a dashboard, but how do you link those two together? That's what I can't well, figure out. No, 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 no. So that's a good question, Eileen. I think next week when we get into the HTML and the CSS, the bootstrapping, all that next chapter six section, you're going to find a lot more reliance in that two server application. So what I'm, what I'm leaning this conversation towards and, and, and Colin, thank you for allowing me to expand on this. What, I, what I'm leaning towards is templating. So Eileen, your, your comment of, of uh, reuse, uh, content reuse, that is a perfect example use case of why you wanna separate those two files because your UI may be able to be used multiple times. Your backend, your server side uh, may change. Uh, we'll talk about that next week as well. So thanks for jumping in. Um, yeah, and it, it, it gets to a little bit more sophisticated organization of your app. And two, we'll get to the other question about like modularizing your app. So when it gets more complex. And so 
um, we're, we're going to get there. And so, um, but yeah, like there's many ways that you can split these files up. Um, but like for just kind of your workflow for some of this, like creating simplified, simple applications, you know, if you can speed up that creating that framework, that's places where you can save time. Um, cool. And then, so let's talk a little bit about, I think that's everything for that one. Uh, so seeing changes faster. So uh, I also like this quote. I actually pulled a lot of quotes from this book because I thought it was, there's a lot of good quotes from it, but at most you'll create a few apps a day, but you'll run apps hundreds of times. So mastering that development workflow is a particularly important. And so the book really says, if you can try and avoid hitting that run app, because that's going to slow you down. And if you're, if you're trying to initialize your app hundreds of times a day, trying to go over here and click this run app over and over again might be slower. So what you can do to get an application up and running is learn that keyboard shortcut of command, uh, command shift enter for my Mac people, control shift enter for my Windows people, um, and you can get your app up and running. And so I'm gonna use this application that I've kind of built uh, as an example. I do have some code that's commented out. Don't worry about it right now, we'll get to it. But basically, I've just created a basic application that's going to take your name and output some text. Now, what you could do is you could hit this run app, make some changes or so make some changes, run the app, stop the app and keep going through that kind of process. But the easiest way to get this up and running is to go shift command for my Windows people, shift control enter for my or for my Windows people and then command shift enter for my Mac people. You can run the application right away, but it's doing that and it pushes it out to your browser. Again, I just have this simple application that we've worked with in the past, but here you go. The other thing that you can do as well is um, you can also run it in the background as a local job. Uh, I thought this was actually cool. Has anybody ever done this before? I did it on accident this week. Oh, that's great. <laughs> it took me a little bit to wrap my mind around it, but so basically, um, if you look at our studio, and I'm going to pull in our session again here. Um, actually, tools, jobs. Okay, so um, usually what's going to happen here is, is when you look at your console section, there should be a jobs tab. If the jobs tab is not open, you can go to tools, go down to jobs, and show jobs. And actually, I'm in the wrong, I'm in my wrong project. I'm sorry. That's why it's not there. So what you can do is you can go over to tools, jobs, show jobs, and then a new tab will open up here in your console here. Now, the only way this is going to work, at least the way I found it to work, is you first have to start with this uh, kind of this little codes or this little script, script here that has two different functions. It has this option shiny dot auto reload equals true, and then the shiny run app at the bottom. And what you can do is you can source this file as long as this file is in the same working directory as a file named app.r, you can run it as a local job. And so what you can do is you once you have this job tab, you click this start local job and you have to set the file path pointing to the R script you want to run, which is going to, going to be your application. And then you're going to slip, select um, the actual working directory that it's going to run from. You click at start, the job's going to start, and it's working in the background. Uh, maybe, maybe I screwed it up here. Uh, no, I'm sorry about this. This is not what I wanted. I wanted to run the other one. So let me source my other job. I had the wrong file. I want to run this one. So it's going to be that little script that you created. Start it. It's going to run, load in Shiny. Now, if you take this here, there's other ways that you can access it and push it through the through the viewer of our studio, but I've really found it easier to kind of go over to your browser and then just push it into your IP or put the IP address here and then you have your application that's running. Now the book talks about why you would do this. The reason why you would do that is because you can make changes within your application and see them in real time. But the problem is, is that if your application gets more complicated and it gets more complex, it's a lot harder to see those changes. But if you're creating a simplified application, this might be a great way to kind of see like, okay, how things are changing, you know, as they're running. 
So if you want to add some extra outputs or you want to add some different layout functions or whatever, this might be a great function for, or this might be a great way to, to kind of optimize your workflow. Uh, to stop it, you just hit stop and then the job stops and then it's cleared. What questions do you have about this or anything that we've talked about previously? I know I kind of went through that kind of fast, but the book really kind of goes into detail about how to do this. So I'll, I'll go ahead, Ryan. Well, I was just going to say, so, so um, I get the idea of doing the keyboard shortcut to launch the app, um, control shift enter, no problem. Um, but you can't really, you can only interact with it at that point. If you need to adjust the code, you then have to close the, close the browser and then return back and, and do your, your code updates. Right. Shouldn't have so, to and shouldn't have to if you're running a local job. So that's the difference then is running it in the background allows you to, to just in, interactively run that. Mm -hmm. So I, I can show you this here real quick. <laughs> Yeah, and that's okay. I get that. Yeah, I get that part. Um, I was just trying to see like why why was the book so excited about the keyboard shortcut when um, just a second later you're going to be mousing all over the place and and stopping you know closing the browser and stopping the session and all that kind of stuff. So um, I think the I think the big thing about this is being able to see changes in real time. So yeah. like if I add like another text input, I'm just going to copy this text input because it's going to make it easier to see. I should be able to see it in real time. So if I save it, once I save it, it should rerun. And if I go back to my browser, you can oh, see cool. in real time. Cool. Yeah, I thought that was super cool when I saw it. I was like, oh, that's neat. But the book, war the book warns you, if your apps start getting more complicated, if you have a lot more dependencies, this little workflow optimization doesn't work as well. Yeah, that's so. probably a few years away for me. So, Well, <laughs> Ryan, what, uh, what I was going to uh, comment on, so this is an a, a, a underlying function of the shiny world, right? So just to, to comprehend that the, sh the, the RStudio IDE generating this particular uh, uh, socket for for you know rendering HTML on your in your browser, and the underlying mechanism that's creating this is a service, and and running a service in the background obviously it doesn't take your resources. So if you're in terminal, you don't lose your terminal. Uh, it just starts a daemon in the in the background. Now the differences with that statement are uh, Windows operating system is services where in Linux and Unix, it's going to be a daemon uh, background. And we may or may not, I don't know in the book, I haven't found that section yet, if it talks starts talking about actually creating your own uh, shiny server and then hosting your code to that point directly. When you run your shiny app, you're actually creating your own web service. So the, the uh, background option or the uh, sh uh, keyboard shortcut keeps your server active and just updates the code directly. Uh, when you are dealing in more of a DevOps, sysadmin, web development type mindset, uh, your server may be completely outside of your local machine, right? It's, it, it may be an active server. So by uh, publishing or posting it or updating it, um, that's really what they're referring to uh, in that, that kind of background method. You're creating your own web server and then updating the, the code directly from that point. I don't know if the book covers it though. I don't, it may be later on in the chapters and we just haven't got to it yet, but um, that's a, that's a, it's a web service type mindset, uh, web development type mindset, so. And then, I mean, you know, like the hosting service and I'm sure you've paid to come across it while you've been looking for shiny stuff is shinyapps.io. Shinyapps.io is managed by our studio for you to host your application so you don't have to host it on your computer basically so um excellent uh so like i said the dis disadvantage of this is it's hard to debug because the app is running a separate process um the book talks about however when you start getting into bigger apps so some of these interactive tests that you that you're kind of doing is going to switch over into doing automated testing and that's chapter 21 so that tells you how far before we get there we're in chapter five 
that automated testing is chapter 21. So we have a little bit before we get there. So I'm not going to talk anymore about that. <laughs> um, okay, so I, I did the local job. Uh, controlling view, I think this is pretty, pretty intuitive, but there's ways in our studio to change where your output is going to be or where your app is going to be outputted, whether you want it to be in the viewer pane in our studio or you want it to automatically push it into the web browser. Uh, there's a sub menu built into it. All you have to do, the biggest thing to know is that you have to click the drop down menu here to see it. Don't click run app and think it's going to drop down. You actually have to click the drop down menu. And it gives you many different um, options to where you want to push it. Do you want it in a window? Do you want it in a viewer pane, which will be down here, like in ggplot? Or do you want to push it out to your browser? Pretty simple concept, but just many different options. So um, keep those in mind. OK, so let's get to my favorite part here, uh, which was debugging. And, and I, I think I learned a lot actually looking over this chapter. And I, I was really appreciative that this was in here because there's a lot of concepts in here that are beneficial, not just for shiny apps, but for just general R coding as well. Uh, I wanted to start off with another one of my favorite quotes, because this is this is where I get in trouble sometimes. Uh, it's an eight line app. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> Uh, I definitely find myself saying that like, oh, this should be easy. Two weeks later, nothing's done. <laughs> so um, I thought it was kind of funny how Hadley had that in there when it's like, oh, it's an eight line app. Well, here's the debugging process I had to go through to get my app to work. But basically, uh, the debugging is defined like this in the book. It's the process of systematically comparing your expectations to reality until you find the mismatch. So we have an expectation of how our app's going to work. We have an expectation of if a user gives us a certain input, it's going to act and behave in a certain way. However, when it doesn't act the way we want it to, then we have to go through this process of debugging. And the book talks about more than likely than not, you're probably going to have to debug sometime in your um, Shiny and R uh, or in your use of Shiny and R. The other thing the book talks about is it takes years of experience to write code that works the first time. I think that's a, I mean, I think that's an experience that everybody has. Uh, I've been writing our code for about four, four and a half years. I am still lucky if I get it in the first time sometimes when I'm writing stuff, especially when shiny. So you kind of need a workflow that you follow to help you identify and fix those mistakes that you're making. And so the book kind of talks about three specific debugging challenges that you're going to face when you are creating a shiny app. And so those three that it was discussed in the book and the review materials that somebody put together before this, put this in kind of like a tree. And I think it does a really good job of kind of organizing it is the three kind of debugging challenges that you're gonna come across are you get an unexpected error, which the book talks about as one of the simplest. Some of the tools that you can use to fix that would be the traceback and then the interactive debugger. We'll talk about these tools here in a second. Um, there's, there's situations where you run into and you don't get any errors. And in those cases, you have to use the interactive debugger. Then you have to kind of do a little bit more investigation. And then the last one, which is going to be the hardest, everything is correct, but there's no update. And this is where the R debugging schools, skills can't help. Okay. So we'll talk a little bit more about each one of these, but we'll talk about how when you run into each one of these cases, what the different tools are you can use. One of those tools being the traceback, the other one being the interactive debugger, and then there's some other ones. I think the book talks about um, print debugging, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. So let's talk a little bit about tracebacks. Um, I think tracebacks are pretty intuitive. Uh, it's a little bit different in Shiny because tracebacks don't work like they do within like a normal interactive script. So in, in R, every time that you get an R, it's going to, or every time that you use R and you have an error, it's accompanied by a traceback, or in other terms, it's called a call stack. And basically what this traceback does is it goes through all the different calls that are made before the error was actually, what before the error actually happened. And so it will print that to your console. Now, when you look at a traceback, it always prints it backwards. So when you look at a traceback, your, your main call will always be on the bottom and then it will go up from there. So the book suggests that when you're looking at a trace stack, mentally try and flip it 
because then it will then we'll make a little bit more intuitive sense of like one, two, three, four, like in chronological order, rather than going from um, latest, no, earliest to latest rather than latest to earliest. So the book kind of talks about this example of a trace back that it goes through and talks about these three different functions. I'm not gonna spend too much time talking about what these functions do, but we're more gonna kind of look at what types of, um, what, what output you'll get. And usually when you're having like, when you're doing things interactively with an R, you'll get an error. And once you get this error, what you can use is this function called traceback to look at the call stack. And in our case, with this simple example, looking at the functions that we create here, the traceback that gets returned is three, two, one. Again, flip this mentally, go one, two, three. So it would be the F function, the G function, and then the H function that got ran. So when you look at this, you want to think of it by flipping it and seeing where the error actually occurred. Um, that was a pretty simple example, but let's talk about Shiny because Shiny is a little bit different. In Shiny, you can't use this traceback function, okay? So within Shiny, what you have to do is, is that Shiny will automatically print your traceback to you. Now, somebody correct me if I'm wrong because I was playing around with this earlier. The traceback only gets pushed when the app session stops. Is that correct? No, I see Kevin shaking his I, head. I don't think so. And I'll okay. show when I do my reprex, I'll show you because I don't think that's quite right. I don't think it's when it stops. It'll run it interactively or it'll just error out when it errors out. Oh, that's probably what was happening to me because I was playing around with it and I was just like, okay, the session stopped and then I got the trace back. So, okay. Okay, that makes and sense. So It'll be in your console. Okay. Yeah, because I was messing around with it and I was getting the error, but I wasn't seeing the trace back on it. And so, but then when I stopped it, it worked, but that probably is an incorrect statement. So who, whoever's watching this afterwards, what I just said was incorrect. So <laughs> I stand corrected on that one. Um, so basically, um, Hadley goes a little bit further in the book, kind of talking about using his examples, using those same three functions where he gets that error before. Uh, and then, you know, he talks about what the traceback is and how it actually runs. Um, and then the book kind of walks through how to kind of read that traceback. And when you run this code with these functions that error out, this is the traceback that you get. Now, what's nice about this is you have to, again, not nice, but what you have to do is you have to flip it mentally. Again, one goes to the top, going on down. So you can kind of think of it, it starts here and then works through all of these different processes. Now, when you look at this, you got to kind of see what are the natural groupings within the trace stack? Because some of these uh, functions that get run aren't necessarily going to be useful to you because they're either starting the shiny session, they're doing things to render certain plots, and then it will finally get to where you're kind of where your error actually happened. So you really got to kind of pick this apart to see, okay, what's my code versus like shiny, just running code to get started up. And so the notes kind of talk more about this, about flipping it, but then it digs into the three components. The first one being just kind of that run app, that run app is, is the, is the shiny app actually initializing and starting up. So it really doesn't matter. Uh, then the second one, it starts talking about some internal shiny code to activate the reactive expression. Uh, there might be some interesting information in here to look at. The one being uh, the output plot is one kind of thing to look at because that's one um, output that you're having pushed out to the UI. And then the third part, which is getting into your actual R code that you've written. And so what's nice to look at this is if you look here with the app.r, with that application that was created, it's the files called app.r, and then it gives you the line number to which this function was run. So then it helps you kind of hone down into that specific location within your application, at least by the specific lines of where your error or the problem might be, okay? So use this traceback to kind of hone in and pinpoint those specific locations where it where your kind of error might be or, or the failed state might be. So what questions does anybody have about trace stacks? 
And I knew I kind of flew through that. So please ask any questions that you may have. Uh, um, um, I, I looked at this. I don't recall seeing the numbers like uh, where you have highlighted right there, R number 13, R number three, R number four. Uh, maybe I just didn't see it. So um, I'm, I'm trying to, to rerun that exercise right now. But if somebody knows for sure if there's like an option that needs to be set in order to be able to see those, um, maybe I just missed it. Um, I mean, it, I think it's pulled from the book. Okay. So, um, I mean, here's the tray stack again. Again, it's flipped here. Here's the original tray stack that you would get. And then again, it's right here and here. I'm wondering, and you actually just copied and pasted this and ran it? No, I, th well, I think I, yeah, I, I, I think I, I keyed it in, but it's okay. Um, I'm going to try to uh, re reproduce the error uh, mm -hmm. and then I'll, I'll mention it again if I, if I did. Okay. Uh, again, and, and maybe that was my own fault in, in using the old, like the previous cohorts materials, because I was trying to save time there. It, something okay. might've changed. So if something did change, please let me know. But Looking at the notes from the book, you know, here's here's kind of what was the output when it was previously ran when the book was rendered. But I guess the, the big thing to really kind of notice about this is trying to find the things to give you more context to where your problem might be. And in your case here, you know, this is a good, this is some good information for you to know, oh, this is the code that I ran. It's in probably line number 13. This is a place I should look for a problem. Now, is this going to lead to you figuring out the problem? Not necessarily, but it's going to at least get you in the right area. So good question, though. What other questions can I answer for everybody about tracebacks or call stacks? All right, let's get into the fun one, the, the interactive debugger. Uh, this one, this is where I learned a lot. Um, so this is when you're having trouble um, it's kind of that second that it's kind of that second challenge that we we're going to run into when you don't get any errors or when you get errors or unexpected errors, you can use the interactive debugger to kind of pinpoint where things are specifically happening and then try and interactively see what's in your environment to um, get better context on what's happening within your application. So <clears throat> what I'm going to do here is when do when do we use? the actual interactive debugger. Um, it's when you've kind of identified the error using that traceback and you wanna look at a specific location and kind of test that specific location for, um, to see what the issue is. So there's two ways to launch the debugger. Uh, the first one is using this function called browser. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna bring in my application that I've been using before. I'm gonna add in some more UI elements. Let's see. Control C. Okay, I'm going to bring in some more UI elements. Here, I'm just going to ask my age. Uh, I want some text output too, so I'm going to make sure I pull in these ones. Control C. So I'm just basically going to ask my age within the Shiny app, and then I'm going to have this other function right here, this render text function. But in it, I'm going to put this function called browser. Now, what's going to be nice about putting this function in here, it, or this browser function, is it's going to stop the actual server from running, and it's going to open up an interactive count, it's going to open up an interactive console in the console area to which I can test the specific state of that function, okay? So now if I run this app, it's running in the background here, you can see my console just changed into this interactive console that I can use. Now you get some different options, um, over here, some stuff changed. It highlights where the browser was actually ran. And here, what you can do is you can start testing certain things. And in my case, I have this numeric input that has a default of 18. And I've called it input age or age, the input being input age. What's nice about this interactive browser now is I can check what that value is. If I do input age. I can see what that value is. Say I want to interact with my application and I'm going to change it to, I don't know, I'm going to go up one year. What I can do is now I can have the function 
run the next iteration of it and test that specific input again. So I can either do that by hitting the N key on my keyboard, which I'm gonna do now, push enter, and then it's gonna run into my browser again, showing where that state is. And then I can look up input question mark age. And it did change because I got to run it through. I got to cycle through it again. But if I do input question mark age, I can check that value. And now it changed to 19. So what's nice about this is if, and this is where this is a working application. If you had an error, what you could do is you could put your browser in the area where that error was occurring and you could test certain outputs. You can test certain values. You can use the function um, stir or structure to look at the certain elements of your inputs. So many different things you can do with browser in this case. Um, if you wanna exit browser, you can either go capital Q, which will quit, or you can do, go stop. If you hit stop, it kills the app. The app is done running. And then you're back into your normal state and your normal console. You're no longer in the interactive debugger, okay? Another way to start this as well is using breakpoints. I don't use breakpoints very often, but what you can do is you can take out browser and over here on the lines right here is you can put a little red dot. And then that red dot is gonna serve like a browser function. It will stop the code at that specific location, open up an interactive um, debugging console over here in your console. And you can do the same kind of interaction like I was doing before, okay? Um, browser, I've used it quite a bit and I use it outside of Shiny too when I'm trying to debug like functions and stuff as well. So this is a tool that you wanna get comfortable with because it is a very, very powerful tool. Uh, what questions can anybody answer or what questions can I answer for um, using the interactive browser? So I probably just blowed your mind with the interactive browser. What's really cool and there's something that I did not know is you can use because browser is an actual function, you can actually use it within a conditional statement and it can only kick off browser if that conditional is met. And so I'm gonna bring in some more code here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna do another text input where I ask what city do you live? And I'm going to create another render text function here. And all this render text function, it now has this conditional built in where if I enter my city of where I live in Lincoln and it matches my input that I provided, that's Lincoln, it's gonna kick off that browser. However, if I don't put Lincoln into it, what it's gonna do is it's just gonna run normally. So I thought that was kind of a neat little, I shouldn't, it's kind of a neat little thing to kind of do some testing to see what would happen if you put a specific input into it. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna run my application. It's gonna get a little bit bigger here. But if I put, I don't know, Omaha in here, it's not gonna kick off my interactive browser and just approve it, it's not my interactive browser. However, if I put Lincoln in here, it's gonna kick off my interactive browser and there it is. And so what I can do is now that I'm in here, I can do, I can test whatever that input is, input question mark city Lincoln. That's the value that Shiny has in its, its specific runtime environment. So I thought that was, I don't know why today I was messing around with that. And I was like, this is like one of the coolest things. I felt, I felt like a computer programmer when I did this. I was like, this is cool. <laughs> um, but it was just kind of flexible. It was kind of neat. So what questions does anybody have about the interactive browser or using a conditional to kick off the interactive browser? So one of the things that I've wanted to use, when I've tried to use the interactive browser, obviously it's like you want to figure out what value does the system think that you're using right now that's causing the problem. Or, or even like say that, say that you're working with... Um, say it's like a, a length times a width column and you and and that's the main function is it's like square square number one square number two square number three square number four a whole list of squares and then there's like length and width and for whatever reason you're having a problem on the length and width but there's but what you really need is which square am i on 
not what's the length and the width. I don't, I, I just need to know like how far down this list did, did I get before it killed over? Um, and so I, I've, I've struggled to try to figure out how do you identify that? Um, and maybe it's too hard to come up with like on the fly, but. Um, my first, and anybody could jump in. My first thing is thinking is, is like, you would treat this as like your inner, you would treat this like your console, but yeah. you're just working inside of the environment to which Shiny created, but you would still need to know what commands you need to run in this interactive console to get what you're looking for. Yeah. And this might be one of those things where it's situation specific that, you know, you're trying to get one thing to work. And so a reproducible example to kind of like make this happen again or to like replicate this yeah. would benefit you most because then someone else could jump in and look at and see, okay, you know, what's going on here and what are the ways we could try and debug it using yeah. the interactive browser. But that's my viewpoint. Does anybody want to add to that? Yeah, I think it makes sense. I just need to probably try it again. Um, try the browser practice with it a little bit more because everything's available, right? The, all the, all the data frames are available. All the functions are still available. Um, right. like you can even figure out what the value of arguments that a function is using through that, right? I imagine that's and, the, that's and the you can pull it out of shiny. It's sometimes hard, but it's, it's, a, if you're really stuck, um, you know, if you're able, I don't know if it's, I can't remember exactly the question, but you know, if you can pull it out of shiny and just rip it out into a script, um, if you're really stuck, if it's a data problem, um, I'm trying to remember exactly what the issue was, but if you can do that, it makes it a lot. If you're really stuck, just try to pull it out. I have to do it yeah. all the time Yeah. Uh, okay. to work out. That's issue. like, Kevin, is that like breadcrumbing then? Would that be a similar concept of, of, of using that pull out? I, I don't know. That's just what I do. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, don't know, well, I don't know that concept very well, but it might be. So the, the first thought that came to mind with, with Ryan's question, uh, uh, Colin, do you mind going back to like two, three weeks ago? There was a, there was a, a feature uh, that you uh, uh, called on that would actually walk through your code. Uh, it, would, it, would, mm -hmm. it would highlight as the program is running. Yeah, and I, so I don't sure remember the. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. That... Yeah, it's the well, browser. Well, no, it was this... it was showcase mode is what you're. I think you're talking about. So like, I can. It go... may have been. Showcase mode. Yeah. Um. Oh, I'm gonna put the file. Just bear Sorry, with me. I know I'm. No, yeah, no, I think this is. I, I, on the fly. I think that's a good point. Um. So examples, chapter five, workflow app. In, in, in the meantime, Kevin, you might be wondering if, uh, if, if if we might be pushing your parts next week. Is that okay if we do that? That's absolutely fine. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, I like to talk. Sorry. <laughs> uh, I just want to be just conscious of everybody's time. So if I run this here, here's the application in its current state right now using Showcase. So um well with ryan's question of of not so much the values you're dealing with but the the section of code where the call is is being used like you're troubleshooting your your script itself or, or the server side script itself so ryan if you if you're going through your uh different square roots that you were referring to uh and you wanted to find where the the exact call was when that error uh was created I don't know if the interactive debugging would be uh, a viable, maybe a, a stepwise type uh, uh, process, but here with the interact or with the uh, showcase mode, uh, you could actually see the uh, line of code or the text that is being rendered uh, to create that variable. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, it'd be another way to pinpoint it. I mean, I think, I think, right. And, and right now I'm showing, I'm showing like a really, like when I was thinking about it, I was like, I'm not going to come across an error and be able to create an error off the, on the fly. But what I can show you is, you know, when something's working so that when you do use the interactive browser, 
you or the interactive debugging browser, you can kind of see how to access those values and what value this this tool could have. Because I mean, for me, it's like I run across an error and then I have to kick off browser to figure out what's going on, figure out what, what the inputs are, what the outputs are. And then that's that's where I'm going to say that's where the magic happens. That's where you got to, you know, you got to kind of use this tool to figure out what's going on. And I think reading the case study too, you know, and I'm not going to talk too much about the case study, but seeing how Hadley kind of goes through that step by step of trying to figure it out, you know, it kind of solidifies kind of that process because he had a data problem that he couldn't solve and so seeing how he kind of walked through that using those tools to solve that might also be another way to kind of look at it and figure out how to use it i think it you know i forgot about that example but you brought it up that's such an important i always ask myself is it a data problem or is it a shiny problem and that's the one of the first questions you have to ask yourself um and actually just pray that it's a data problem because you can fix that (laughs) It's easier to <laughs> I mean, and once we get into testing, I have a, I mean, I have constant data coming in. So I have tests and I will put it in my app and I'll let the client see the test. It's like a checklist. And I'll go, I'll just hope if something's not working, it's in that, it's in that <laughs> thing. Cause that's an easy fix. <laughs> Cause then I don't know why it's not working. So. That's a, that's a great point. I might actually add those to the notes. I might say like, I might put in like big bold letters. Are you dealing with a data problem or a shiny problem? That's a good way to think of it. I never thought of it that way. Um, excellent, excellent conversation. So um, I put some more kind of commands in here. I have about one, a couple more minutes. I think we could talk about debugging reactivity really quick because the book just says, hey, if you have problems with debugging reactivity, you don't have enough tools to fix it. Uh, So we're going to get to this later is basically what the book says. Um, But the book does talk about a specific way to debug it called print debugging. And print debugging talks about using um, this function called message to push messages out to your console as the application is running. And to just quick briefly show you, I have another example of this real quick. I'm going to make my app a little bit bigger here. I'm just going to ask my specific state, like where you live, specific state. I'm going to bring in this observe event where I'm going to use this function called glue, where what I'm going to do is I'm going to take input state and I'm going to use this message glue. And I'm going to use this type of notation here to bring in that variable that's in the environment. And what's going to happen is this observe event depending on what's selected with the input is gonna be pushed to the console. Now, this, is, this conversation goes a little bit beyond this, but if you were hosting this on like a web server or something, this message function will push it, and somebody correct me if I'm wrong, will push it to the logs of the application. And so you can be able to look at those logs. Again, that conversation might be a little bit beyond what we're talking about tonight, but the book talks about use this message to make those logs. Okay, so. Oh, so and mom's not here? Yeah. Okay, I'll be right there. <laughs> she's going to die. All right, right so uh, let me just run this real quick and show you what happens here. So I'm going to run this. My default is Alaska on here. So you'll see Alaska gets pushed. Our Alabama is, is default on this. But you'll see in my application as I run it, and I should bring this over here so you can see it. Uh, yeah. So you can see it. If I change my state, uh, this is not working the way I want it to, but if I change my state, let's just say Arkansas, I'm going to change it a couple of times, Colorado, Connecticut. If I look over at my console, this observe event is now pushing a message to my console to say, hey, the user selected Alabama, the user selected Colorado, so on and so forth. So this is a way for you to kind of push messages out. So I, I felt... I kind of felt like, well, this doesn't really debug reactivity, but, you know, the book is really clear that says, hey, you need more tools to solve this. So we're going to cover it in a later chapter. So um, that's debugging in a nutshell. I'm sorry we couldn't get to reproducible examples, but um, you're off the hook, Kevin. (laughs) We're this week. (laughs) This week. No, no problem. I was going to say, I wish the uh, book would tie in Git a little bit better. You know, I was thinking about that. Git is your best friend when you're doing Shiny because if you go down a hole, you can just revert 
you can comment out. <laughs> it's or you know, if I'm making a major change, if I'm making a major change, I will have it on a branch for sure. If I have a working app that people use, any even small UI changes go on a branch first so you can test it. Um, and you can always go, oh, we're gonna come back to this later. <laughs> I just but I know it'd probably be too hard to get into Git, but it is it that's where your Git skills and knowledge come into play and you can test it. Yeah, and then like versioning and you know, looking at features and that gets into like more of like project management and like managing the application, managing functionality. And that's like for me, that's I just I'm learning that stuff, but I'm not like too adept on it. So, but good point though. What other questions? Kevin, if you, Go ahead. I didn't interrupt. Uh, uh, Kevin, you made a statement about Golem. Uh, I think it was maybe the one of the first times we met. Um, I just did a quick research. Golem is is kind of almost like package management ish. Yeah. Um, I'll I'll do more research on the subject so I sound more intelligent, but. You use Golem quite a bit, correct? Yes, I love it. And and when we were discussing the fact of, of your testing feature just a moment ago, you were expressing as code is running or, or, or you're doing your, your uh, service testing, uh, recording that so you can show to the customer, hey, I did you know validate this uh, uh, application, et cetera. It, it's, it's data-driven or it's shiny-driven. Uh, or you had mentioned that you want to make sure that it's within this test environment. It's a feature that you're you're validating. Um, are is that Golem that you're using? Um, no, no. I mean, no, no, not at all. Um, so when you want to test testing functions, has always been a little tricky for me with we'll test that. Okay. But Point Blank is a package that tests data, tests your table data. It okay. is. Fabulous. And then you can turn your point blank functions. You can use a function to write tests. And so that's what I'm adept at. I want to know because you never yeah. know what people are going to do with your with data. Yeah. Do weird yeah. things. And if data comes in, if there's, um, if someone didn't complete a survey, but it's coming in, I know yeah. somehow it beat my filter or I missed a, um, something's missing or I there's a duplicate somehow yeah the entry for the same student I know <laughs> would it be yeah. similar to like an SQL injection then is that kind of the the whole I reasoning don't know for it, I don't tracking know with that, that then it's I'm a, sorry sir um like a it's just a downloadable you can put it a markdown report and so okay. I just put it into my app where you can download it and you can you can so it's, I doubt if the client ever reads it, that, you know, that's where they hire, but I just put it, it's actually a way for me to test it too, because nice. that report's going to be live. What, what I do believe what's shiny, cause it's, it's packaged. And so that's the most updated report. So it, you know, you're just checking your counts. It's sometimes it's simple, but you know, if you're have a null value, um, it messes things up. <laughs> so mm -hmm. It's just, sometimes it's silly, but you start silly, but what can break me? What could be embarrassing? Yep. <laughs> and so you no, test that's it. Really, I'll definitely look into that too. Uh, uh, I didn't mean to take us off another tangent there, Colin. Forgive me. No, you're good. You're good. Uh, these, these, um, you know, these conversations lead to other ideas and stuff. And so, um, Kevin, I'll reach out to you about that data checking package because that that sounds like something that Let I me need. Put it in the chat too. Yeah, put it in the chats because that sounds interesting and I, I need that. So um, we are at seven o two, and I, and I don't want to force anybody to stay here. So Ryan, you want to wrap us up and we yeah. should be good to go. Yeah, everybody um, is welcome to leave if you have to. Thank you all for your time. Um, next week, we said Kevin, you'll be able to pick up on the reprex at the beginning, and then. Um, and then Ryan, you were going to do part of it, right? Yeah. Do you want me to be ready for a halfway point, Kevin, or, or do you think it'll take the whole hour for, for the reproducible? Unless you guys have a lot of questions, I would say about 15 to 20 minutes. Okay. Most, unless you guys have a lot of questions. 
Okay. So yeah, I guess we'll just plan on splitting it. But Ryan, if it if it does roll over to the following week, just be prepared. That's a possibility. So I'm good either way, sir. Okay. Cool. Um, then I guess we can wrap it up. I I had one remaining question that had to do with source and what sourcing means, especially in the sense of debugging, which is you know sometimes it says like save to source or you know, uh, you know whatever it is debug if you have the source done. <laughs> and so I had I just had a question about what the source is. I can I can hang out for a little bit if people have other questions too. I just I don't want to hold anybody. People got to jump out, but I can I can hang out for a little bit and answer some questions if people have okay. them. So okay. fire away. <laughs> that's, that's that's my question is just about um, when it, when there's like something that talks about source and sourcing things. And like a file needs to be a source in order to debug or whatever. And I, I don't understand the concept of a source of sourcing. I think, I think Ryan would be great for that. Well, so yeah, this is, and, and, and anytime you hear the word source, think of it as like, it's, it's, it's gospel. You can't change it. It's written in granite, right? A, a source file is intended to be not touched. So when Kevin made a comment a moment ago about branching into another uh, service, so what you're doing is you're taking your, your source file, you're copying it. So now you have like a Ryan S, you know, uh, uh, trial, uh, Ryan S debug, right? So you're taking it from source and then you're creating this, this branch copy that you can start to manipulate, change and test. If the topic is uh, discussing, you know, quote unquote debugging source, well, it's just a, it, it's, it's the, it's the thought process that that is your, uh, legitimate file. You don't want to mess it up. You don't want to change it because that's an active running service. Mm -hmm. um, Kevin, does that maybe talk about your statement of branching or, or I, I hope that I'm uh, uh, supporting the thought, Ryan, for, for how we're thinking of it? No, that's no. I just when I was talking about branch, I was just talking about Git. Um, and when I think yeah. of sourcing, I will every once in a while, run us let's say i want to run a bunch of scripts at the same time the only way i know is that you're sourcing the file to run next yeah and that's the only context that i'm familiar with well another another thought that could also help ryan and 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 using the vocabulary term source so you probably ran into some language or some uh, forum posts uh, where they're talking about compiling from source have you ever heard that no, but before. I think not specifically, but I think that's kind of the same idea. It's the sense okay. that's the sense I get from these messages I see here. So in that case, what we're talking about from compiling and source, if the environment that I'm working in, say I've got this other Unix environment that the package manager doesn't work, right? Or or uh, in in really rare cases, you can run Linux uh, uh, programs on a Mac computer, right? So we're talking about switching operating systems. The Mac environment may not have it uh, as a, a, a compiled program. So I need to go to the Linux source, the package manager, grab that material and then compile it so it'll run on Mac. That's another subject when we use the term source. It's, it's, a, it's a developer application that we don't really uh, have access to, but we may need to, to grab it and use in the environment that we're operating in. Yeah. I think that could that, be another term. Yeah. Are you getting an error message talking about something about source? Um, let me see. Let me see if I can share this real quick. Um, let me take out something real quick. We'll just take a second. Um, there's, there's a. Um, Oh, I, got, I, I stumbled into it in a, another cohort, another group a couple of years ago, but they were talking about uh, JavaScript libraries. And in that case, when you make a JavaScript call to some source environment on another server someplace in the ether, uh, there is a package management program and I'm losing myself because it was a, like a, I, I, I viewed it as like a global term. It was like, it, it just existed for everybody to access. Um, I don't want to say Redis service, but it's similar to that thought process. Yeah. Okay. 
Um, I'm just, I'm, I'm just seeing like this interactor, this, this button right here, source, source with echo. Um, I'm trying to set a breakpoint. This is breakpoints cannot be set until the file is saved. Yeah, so you have to save your file, you know, you have to actually physically save the script. And then there's this button, source on save. Yeah, that's an interesting term. I will find some more information on what that, uh, what that's referring to, what that, uh, I'm wondering if. Well, wait a minute. Could... So wait a minute. So this file that you have right now, is it an R file? It is. It's just an R file. It's, just, it's an unsaved. It's an unsaved file. I just because okay, because I was looking at mine and my files are saved. So yeah. I'm like source. I'm wondering if it's treating it as a text file until you actually save it, right. and then it's Good trying point. to source it as like a text file. So the reason why you're seeing source is it's treating it like a text file. Yeah. I mean, that's just my. That's what I think. I, I mean. So that's your path variable. That could be maybe what it's talking about. It's like the uh, underlying uh, program associated with the syntax of that uh, uh, media type. So it hasn't it hasn't assigned itself yet. It doesn't know what the source is. Okay, that's a possibility. It would yeah. make sense in that regard. So if you if you were to take that file that you're sharing right now, just do a file save as and and name it you know, whatever, Ryan S dot R, just mm -hmm. make sure you have the R extension on the end. Mm -hmm. So right now at the bottom of your, of your file name. Okay. So your, your save, your save as type is all files at the moment. Yeah. I, do you have a drop down option in that? Uh, it's grayed out. So I'm going to say probably not. Okay. So let's just say this is, you know, Ryan S dot R just make sure you put the dot R on the end and then save that. And it should automatically associate on your computer to using the R program. Uh, no, that's still doing that, doesn't it? That's really. Well, it's allowing you to put the breakpoints in there now. Yeah, so that it's because it's saved. Has that happened? Has that happened with every R file you've created? It gives you a source. You mean this this button right here? No, yeah, that and then the source on the right, because when I create an R file and I save it. Yep. Uh, and it might be because you put a dot R at the end on your save as. I don't know. I'm, and I'm trying to. Um, I, there was something about sourcing when it comes to debugging as well, and I'm going to have no ability to recreate the, that problem um, to recreate that, but. Let me just let me just see. I'm gonna put library tiverse and then I'm going to because the other question that I have with the source is it looking for what and this may this might be wrong. Like is it looking for what type of interpreter you're using? Like if you're gonna use a bash interpreter, and this is more of a question for Ryan M, like you know, is it looking to source it from like bin slash bash or like whatever the, and yeah, I may be saying. That's, no, that's I okay. Be... That's where that, no, you're, you're, you're heading in the right direction. That's where that path concept came in. Do you remember we were dealing with the Git stuff at the very beginning mm -hmm. of our cohort? And mm -hmm. I had you go into those environmental variables, look at the path, and that, that that's a pointer for your Windows environment to access that bin library. Mm. That could be part of it. Uh, when we install R on a Windows computer, it should establish all of those paths for us. If it is coming from a different installation media, that may be where things start breaking. I wouldn't want you to uninstall and reinstall. That's too much work and I don't want to modify your, your computer at all. But Colin's heading in a, in a, in a direction though that would be possible. Well, but the other thing too is I just saved a test file myself and I still have the source in my IDE. I do too. Yep. That's, I don't know. I, I'd have to look into that. Why, what is the sort? What does it do? Source. Uh, like I created. So, okay. So I created an error, something that actually errors. Um, 
Do you guys see it okay? Yep, I do. So load the little tiny verse, although I don't think I need it actually. Um, mm -hmm. I made this test variable, which is the letter A. There's a function here, browser call, test variable. I'm adding eight to the letter A. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if I try to run, if I run this right now, it works, it works fine in the sense that it causes the error um, and I can interact with it there. But let me see what happens if I do put all of this into a brand new script and then try to run it. It'll work. Debug location is approximate because the source is not available. I don't think we got that on the other one, right? I've seen that before too. When the function opens up on the when when the function opens up when you're using brought when you're using yeah. uh, interactive. But okay. I, I'm curious now. I, I have no idea what source is. Well, and the, then, there's this. And then it, sorry, just real quick. So then if I hit so this is just a normal file that gets saved. Um, I close that. So this is just a normal file script that gets saved. I run it, hit the browser, debug location is approximate because the source is not available. Okay, fine. Stop that debugger. And then if I hit source on save, now I hit save and it has sourced it. Um, and now you can see just by the act of saving it, the, the, it, it, invoked, it, it invoked the debugger. I, I I just sent a a, a forum post. It's a R Studio. Uh, what do you call this? Support page. Uh, Colin, I I initially sent it to you, and then Ryan, I'm sending it as a second time. In this case, it's talking about this source as being a method in which you could expand the R Studio into multiple monitors. Now that's a weird scenario. I know you've got multiple monitors, Ryan, but I don't think that's the same concept that we're asking the question yeah. of when we get a error or a, a topic like that, um, we may be going two different directions here. I'm gonna, try yeah, I'm, I'm gonna have to do some more research on that because I don't know what the well, sourcing I'll, does. Is that an IDE specific option or is that on the RStudio server as well? I'll try this real quick. I don't know. I mean, I found the Stack Overflow post that's like, it says something like, despite numerous searches, I can't find, seem to find a clear explanation <laughs> as to what source on save means. Granted, this was right, written in 2018, so there might be a better That's answer nice. somewhere, but. All right, so we're going to go uh, control shift new, control new. Martha, are you just sitting there thinking, I can't believe these guys don't know what source on save means? Yeah, I should have. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I'm not certain what source means, but I have a feeling it's it's to do with one identifying the location of where a document is located and two sort of running the code in that file. So yeah, I have not really gone deep into it because there was a time I noticed that uh, when a uh, Dropbox was automatically saving my R scripts, it would run source. Uh, so when I save, a script maybe after making changes on the console i'd see source and then the path but then also i've seen uh so i was looking at some shiny work I, I can't seem to trace it now oh no it was not shiny it was a map script so they had the function in one script and then so on another script then you source the other script mm -hmm. so i i have I'm, I'm not quite sure i don't have the details but i think uh -huh. you we we you we, we are in the right direction <laughs> mm. yeah i, I think <laughs> what you said was that it's almost like it it runs it or it compiles it to some degree when you save it and and that seems to bear out because when i hit save here it notices that error error and test variable plus 8 yeah right so yeah. Uh, yeah. Sorry, Colin. Um, I'm really sorry to take you back, but if like in just one minute, there was uh, in the interactive debugging, I think. So there was the aspect where you had another script that sort of called the app.r. Uh, so oh, yeah. 
yeah is it is it that you just call the script or what what was happening there yeah so i went i went through that pretty quick um so let me share my screen here real quick with you um share screen share screen so and i never knew i mean i i knew that you could do local jobs so can you see my r session mm -hmm. yeah. okay so um it was probably a couple of years ago because this hasn't always been available but um our studio came out with the ability to run jobs, which basically runs everything separate from like your console. It runs it as like a separate process. And what's nice about this is what the book was saying, and I haven't done this before, but what you need is you need to have this, you need to have kind of a short script in the same directory as the app.r. And the book kind of gives more detail about, well, it links you out to some more materials to explain how to do it. But it talks about setting these two, um, these two functions. So setting your options, which is setting, I think it's setting a global option so that Shiny auto reloads in the session. So when the file saves, it auto reloads it. So every time you save the file, it just reloads it. And then this one just actually kicks off the application. And so all I think this script is doing is it's just changing that global option. And so, and then it runs the app. And so when you do this, all you have to do, and now you're putting me on the spot because I got to remember how to do it now, because I've done this like today and that was all. Um, so then I have this code here. If I go over to jobs, if I go to tools, jobs, and this is if, if the jobs tab isn't open, go to show jobs. Okay. Click on show jobs and you get this jobs tab. And um, depending on what you have, I had already ran a couple jobs, so you may have to click back to go see what jobs you've actually run. But there should be this button called start local job. It will open up this menu right here. Then in this menu, it's gonna say what R script, like what R script do you wanna use and what do you wanna run? In our case, we're gonna run that simple app shiny run in this here. And then we tell it, okay, well, what's your working directory for this process to run? Set that, which is this one right here where all of it is. And then you could just start the job, kick it off. And now it's running in a separate process outside of what your console is running. So you still have access to your console, but the job is still running in the background. Mm -hmm. So if I want to look at this one, like take my IP address and, and the port number, plug it into my browser, yeah. it should be good to go. So here's my application that's running right now. Okay, thank you. I, I think like, I think just again, I think what the book was talking about is this is a great way to kind of like, like I said, like if you're changing your UI, you know, if you're like changing your UI or you're making simple changes, this is a great way to kind of see it change in real time. But it kind of had that kind of step back. It's like, hey, if you're doing like, if you're working with a big application, it's this probably isn't the best way to go about doing it. Okay. And you do have to stop the job too. You either have to kill Shiny or you have to stop the job to actually stop the application. And there you go. I like this jobs one because I've used it for like outside, not just Shiny, but like normal like data processing that takes a long time. I've used I've used jobs and stuff before. It's fabulous. Um, so if you have something that if you have a process that takes like a super long time, like 30 minutes, 45 minutes. It's great because you still have access to your console. It just kicks off a different process on the side. At least and, I've and you that have, today. And you have, prior, you have access to your scripts as well, I assume. Yep, you have access to everything pretty much. I mean, okay. like I said, this was, this was a feature that they added. I don't know the exact feature, but it was within the past, I wanna say two years, don't quote me on that, but it, it's a fairly recent 